Well, Lil, what is this fantastic tale you have about aboriginals and cannibals in Australia? Fantastic? I suppose it is. But first, uh, I have a book here that tells an amazing story. And after that, comes the story of this madcap expedition to the cannibal country of Australia. And we're going to make a, an expedition into that region. And we're going to make a discovery, a startling one, and then a surprise, a bewildering surprise. But first, this book, it tells about a race of people who lived and flourished on this old planet of ours from 25,000 to 50,000 years ago. You mean from 50 to 100,000, don't you? <laughs> well, so what's the matter of 50,000 years between <laughs> friends? <laughs> How do we know about this strange race of cavemen? Well, the book tells us. It's called Men of the Old Stone Age, and it's written by a famous scientist, a member of this explorer's club, Professor Henry Fairfield Osborne, the head of the American Museum of Natural History. And it gives us a really thrilling account of how ancient skeletons have been found in caves over in Europe. Now let's take a peek into this uh, book, Men of the Old Stone Age. Here we have a picture of skeletons of the cave age of mankind. The skeletons were discovered in a grotto on the shores of the Mediterranean near Monte Carlo. The gambling palace, the pale gamblers, the jeweled women, and not far away, the age-old cave with the bones of these unremembered people of long ago. There was no Monte Carlo then, no roulette, no cards. They had stone hatchets and clubs, but no spades. A skeleton of ancient man was found in the valley of Neanderthal in a cave near the city of Düsseldorf in western Germany. And after that, all skeletons of men similar to the one that was found in the valley of Neanderthal were considered as belonging to one race. And these men were called Neanderthal. And that is where we get the term Neanderthal. And after that, uh, many more skeletons were found in caves. And it was definitely proven by scientists that at one time, the so-called Neanderthal man lived and lorded it over the wildlife of Europe, over the mammoth, the woolly rhinoceros, and the saber-toothed tiger. Or possibly the saber-toothed tiger lorded it over them. What kind of a fellow was Fritz Neanderthal? Well, I'm afraid he was a lowbrow. Here in the book are two typical examples of a Neanderthal skull. You can see that he didn't have much brain capacity and nothing highbrow about the old boy. But he did have a huge animal-like jaw. And the ridges over his eyes remind us of an ape. Here in Dr. Osborne's famous book, we have him uh, compared with an ape, and we have him compared with the modern type of human being. At the left is a chimpanzee, in the middle is our friend Mr. Neanderthal, and at the right is the skull of a modern European. Look at the difference in the height of the skulls, and look at the big bony ridges above the eyes of the ape and the Neanderthal. And here is old boy Neanderthal in the flesh. That is, the scientists have put a reconstruction of flesh on the prehistoric skull. The experts at the American Museum of Natural History tell us that this is what Mrs. Neanderthal had opposite her at the breakfast table every morning. Yes, our ancient cousin, the Neanderthal, was a primitive, almost unearthly creature. Apparently, he was well suited for those days of the mammoth, the woolly rhinoceros, and the saber-toothed tiger. And the purpose of our expedition, the one we are starting on right now, is to investigate a rumor that Neanderthal man still lives on this spinning planet of ours in the torrid unknown of Australia, that backwash of forgotten animals and forgotten men. Yes, and find him alive, the man of 50,000 years ago. And after that, the weird surprise. We are running away from civilization. We are escaping, fleeing, hot-footing it across the map. We are following the path of the sun to where the South Seas begin. Ah, but civilization is a persistent, nagging wife, and she catches up with us every so often. Ocean liners, speedboats, hotels, we find them all here. For Hawaii is one of the great whoopee resorts of the world. Moonlight, ukuleles, and romantic retired storters wooing the voluptuous magic of the tropics.
but we dodge all things below. Our looks are for something primitive. Dad who wants a drink, so he makes a monkey of himself. I mean he wants a drink of coconut milk. He makes a monkey of himself and then drinks. While in some other parts of the world, they drink and then make monkeys of themselves. So they tell me. Out of sheer exuberance, this son of a South Sea acrobat cuts a few monkey shines. Maybe he feels the voluptuous magic of the tropics. Or maybe someone gave him 50 cents to do it. And of course, they dance the hula hula. She's half Hawaiian and half European. Her name is Miss Love, and the name seems to fit. Ah, a full-blooded Hawaiian. Here is the type of South Sea enchantress the novelists write about, and that has caused many a sailor to forget home and mother. When they're not dancing the hula hula, they are out surf riding. This is an ancient traditional art of these island Polynesians, children of the sea and the sun. Nowadays, it's a favorite sight for the tourists to watch. Yes, and these tropical athletes have become the gigolos of the South Sea. Against these shores of coral and volcano break the unceasing waves of the Pacific, the most glorious surf in all the world. Look how that darting line shoots across the degrees of longitude. Let's follow it in our flight from civilization. Let's follow it to a garden of Eden where the serpent of modern progress has scarcely been seen. An isle where the mystery of the Orient blends with the world of the Southern Cross. The island of Bali. The latest fad for the sophisticated traveler. The latest tropical paradise to be celebrated with rapturous hosannas of Ballyhoo. Of Bali Ballyhoo. Or as our English cousins would say, of Bali Bali Ballyhoo. What? But as yet, few travelers have found their way to these remote shores. The ways of life in Bali are those of centuries ago. In place of motor trucks and freight trains, the Balinese have simpler ideas. The men use their heads. That is, they make the women use their heads. The textile industry is much the same here as it was when it was imported from India in the days of Chandragupta, when Alexander the Great campaigned in the land of Hindustan, and when all the silks and gorgeous fabrics of the earth were woven by hand like this. Bali lies below the equator, south of Borneo and west of Java, amid the spice islands of the fabulous Indies. The civilization is Hindu, the people are Malay. And these girls have the same delicate grace and charm as the court dancers of Java. The Balinese maidens are famous in the East for their beauty of face and figure, with special emphasis on figure. When the wandering seafarer lands on these shores and sees the Balinese maiden, he touches his forehead to the earth three times and says, How long, oh, how long has this been going on? Why has my education been so sadly neglected? Oh, never more do I wish to see the Union Depot in St. Louis or the main stem in Ashtabula. And here among the maidens of Bali, the wandering seafarer gives three Bronx cheers for the Bronx. They're simple, childlike creatures, maidens of the sun. It is they who provide the charm and make Western civilization seem highly unnecessary. As for you, Miss Bolly, well, as we leave, we give a scientific sigh. Now we return to the realm of Uncle Sam, but don't be alarmed. We're not going to land at San Francisco or Hoboken. This is Pango Pango, where you don't care a hango hango whether you ever go home or not. It's the American part of this Samoan island, and the stars and stripes don't float over any lovelier, lazier land than this. We are in the realm of the beachcomber, the trader, the missionary, and also the realm of rain. Yes, this is the rainmaker, this mountain. When the heavy clouds drift across Samoa and bump into its summit, down it comes in sheets, rain, drenching rain. In fact, here is the home of the girl of rain. Here lived Sadie Thompson, the woman around whose picturesque life the play Rain was written. 
All through Polynesia, there's music, singing, and dancing. The natives are of the same race as the Hawaiians, and the girls here dance the Samoan version of the hula hula. What's the difference? Well, in the Hawaiian hula hula, they shimmy and then they shiver. In the Samoan hula hula, they shiver and then they shimmy. It's an old South Sea custom, and long may she wave. In our quest for Neanderthal man, we seem to be running into a few non-Neanderthal women. Between the maidens of Bali and the Polynesian hula hula, we are in serious danger of forgetting all our science, paleontology, anthropology, and other little ologies, and it might be a good idea. But just the same, anthropological duty calls us. So goodbye, girls, we're on our scientific way. With a deep sigh, we watch that darting line cross more meridian. But just the same, we haven't hit any civilization. We are in Fiji now, the Fiji Islands, famous in song and story as the Cannibal Isles of old. Giant black women and men with towering fuzzy hair pound on the earth with strange barbaric musical instruments. They chant weird songs that send the shivers along our spines and remind us of the old ferocious cannibal days. here are of another race. They are black Melanesians. We find the girls are not quite up to the high standard to which us, us scientists have become accustomed. No, we don't care so much for this concert and ballet dancing. We wish we were back in Bali where the ballet is better. But this is Fidgety Fidgy. But here's something to admire. Watch that boy. There are no springboards out here. But these youngsters get along nobly without them. They're the flying fish of Fiji. Boys are much the same the world over. The good old equatorial swimming hole. They'd hang their clothes on a hickory limb, only there isn't any hickory and they don't wear clothes. Well, we're too near the great islands of New Zealand to miss paying a visit to those strange people, the Maori. So we drop in at Rotorua, a village of that magnificent race. The Maoris have rapidly become civilized, but they still cling to much of their old aboriginal mode of life, their beautifully carved houses, and their fantastic symbolical dances and pantomimes. <laughs> mother carries her young hopeful like a papoose, and then she sings it a Rotorua Maori lullaby.
Well, the Maoris are of that same great South Sea race which seems so close to the white race. They might almost pass for Europeans or Americans. They are one of the tallest, most powerful of all peoples, and one of the finest. I should say what time is it flowers, because this is a floral clock. It's a kind of sundial made of flowers. But anyway, by any clock, it's time for us to be on our way to the land of deserts and rivers that run nowhere. But first we see the black swans, and don't tell any Australian girl that she has a swan-like throat or she'll stop and wash her neck. She'll not be as proud as a peacock if you tell her she has a throat like a swan. As for the south end of a peacock going north, well, there's something to behold. And among the Sydney peacocks, we find a few platinum blondes. Handsome birds, too. This is a blonde captive, all right, but not the one we are destined to find before this mad jaunt is over. We are leaving now for the wilderness. And here we are on the trail of something primitive. These Australian teddy bears remind us that we are in a land that is a throwback into the vast ages of geological time. These teddy bears are not bears at all. They merely look like fuzzy little bear cubs. They are koalas. Like all the native animals of Australia, these jolly little fellows are marsupials, more primitive than the true mammal. They carry their young in a pouch like the kangaroo, like Mrs. Old Possum of Alabama. They're charming little creatures with soft, wistful eyes. Their sole diet is the leaf of a certain kind of tall, towering eucalyptus tree, the tree that sheds its bark instead of its leaves. The koala never drinks water. If you drop a sip of water in his mouth, he'll try to chew it. He loves candy and he loves cake, but his stomach isn't made for such things. If he eats them, he dies. They formerly were numerous in Australia. But the white man with his guns and dogs has nearly exterminated them. Their fur was valuable. Now they are protected. The white man is trying hard to repopulate the trees with droves of these funny little Australian teddy bears. When the fond mother goes to dinner at the top of the eucalyptus tree, she gives young Ignatz a ride on her back. I suppose you'd call this piggyback, but these are not pigs, so I guess we'll have to let it go as bareback. And after the banquet, she has a snooze in a treetop. You might try this one sometime. Of course, we know that Australia is famous for its sheep. It has also been known to have a few black sheep. Black sheep, remember the bush, bush rangers? 
Most of our wool comes from Australian sheep, though not the black variety. They're all white nowadays, we are told. Australia also has vast herds of cattle and immense ranches. What? Camels? Are we in Arabia or the Sahara? Or in bone-dry Kansas where the sacred animal is the camel? Yes, to be sure, Australia is a land of desert. So the modern Australian has imported the ship of the desert. We land in East Australia and we are headed for North Australia. But there is no straight route as the crow flies for us in this lonely continent of the Southern Hemisphere. We must head south before we can go north. We take the train to Melbourne, then to Adelaide, then by the Transcontinental Railroad to Old Dia. And here we find something. Here we find the men that scientists have long thought the most primitive on Earth. If man is climbing any evolutionary tree, these boys are right at the bottom. They are Australia's real native sons. How pitifully grotesque he looks in tattered reach-me-down London togs. And if he could sing, you made me what I am today, he would be cursing the white man in a language you have never heard, cursing the white man's ways and the white man's clothes. He has been driven from his better lands to the desert. But it is beyond the desert, beyond the never-never land to which we go by airplane. We are going to find a man of still more primitive type, the living Neanderthal. From old Dea, we fly for four days through Australian skies, and Australia is a land of emptiness. Although larger than the whole United States, it has a total population only about equal to that of New York City. The Australians have an expressive way of describing this enormous uninhabited empire of nothingness. They call it miles and miles of damn all. After 24 hours of flying, we land at Broome, a seaport on the northwest coast, the center of the world's pearl fishing industry, but by no means a jewel of a place. No, not pearls. Beer, barrels and barrels of beer. The veranda of the Governor Broom Hotel is joyfully decorated with barrels of beer and Miss Australia is sitting pretty. On the outskirts of Broome, we find the priceless chapel. And in this chapel, we see an altar made of mother of pearl, clustered with pearls. The aboriginal pearl fishermen presented these treasures to the padres who first brought the cross to this godforsaken coast. The walls of this chapel of pearls are made of mud, and the roof is made of tin cans saved up by the natives and flattened out. Until the missionaries came, it is doubtful whether the Australian Aborigine even worshipped the supreme being. But now, he even builds Christian altars of mother of pearl. We're off into the black aboriginal spaces of the Never Never Land. No, it isn't quite as good as the Lincoln Highway. But the desert is fairly flat, and we can zip along in our two-ton sport coupe at about 40 miles an hour. That is, part of the time we can. Well, well, jumping kangaroos. Neither Mark Twain's jumping frog nor the Mexican jumping bean can shake a leaping leg with these bounders. Yes, I mean bounders. The national sport in Australia is chasing kangaroos on horseback. And the true Australian sportsman doesn't shoot his kangaroo. He rides alongside it. Then he takes his foot out of the stirrup. And then he cracks Mr. Kangaroo over the head with the stirrup. Step up, ladies and gentlemen, and meet Dr. Paul Withington, the rollicking scientist. The doctor has explained to us that we're here to seek Neanderthal man because Australia is a backwash of primitive animals and primitive men. He's proving the animal part of it now by yanking down a weird lizard left over from the age of reptiles, almost a diminutive dinosaur. This funny-looking chap is a modern relative of those giant reptilian monsters that once strutted the earth. Yes, and he's a warlike fellow. Look at that fan-shaped headdress. He's always on the guard like this. And what he wouldn't do to us if he was big enough. And here we find more of the primitives. Here's the oldest mammal known to science, the duck-billed platypus, with a bill and webbed feet like a duck and fur like a beaver. It lays eggs but suckles its young. It lives in the water, yet builds its nest in the bank of a stream. Our trip from Broome by motor finally brings us to a place which is indeed a place of death for the Aborigines. It is called Moolaboola. 
It's a reservation, a governmental sanctuary for tribal remnants that are ravaged by disease. When the white settler came to Australia in 1788, the native Australians numbered about 150,000, not many. That means that all of the aboriginal inhabitants of Australia would have made only one medium-sized modern city. Now, less than half that many remain, hardly 60,000 aborigines on that vast continent. Moolaboola may be a funny name, but it's not a funny place. They are getting their ration of tobacco. No, the white man is not passing out any clear Havana Panatellas with Sumatra wrappers at this banquet. But the old boys enjoy their El Ropo Snickadoros just the same. The men get theirs first, and the women get what's left. And so the dreary procession passes. A monument to the ways of the white man and the advance of civilization in a place where civilization doesn't work. The aborigines had many harsh customs. If a woman was too curious, if she was caught gazing on the tribal love rites of the men, her eyes were burned with firebrand. And this is what happened to this helpless creature who was being led by her little daughter. On and on we go through barren, desolate country, and now and then we encounter more of the aborigines. And whenever we see one, man, woman, or child, we stare into their faces looking for something of those peculiar, abysmally primitive characteristics that science has ascribed to the Neanderthal man. This is the queen of the village of sticks and bark. She's not yet 40 and presumably beautiful. To her boyfriend, she may be Miss Australia or Miss Universe, but more likely she is just Miss Fortune. And a new baby was born just four hours prior to our arrival. These people may be the most primitive race known to science, but this looks like a newborn baby, that's all. Nothing particularly Neanderthal here. Already its mother is up and singing. By baby bunting, daddy's gone a-hunting to get a kangaroo skin to wrap his baby bunting in. Along the Pearl Coast, the women do the work. These tribal beauties are carrying a supply of water for us. They're carrying 200 gallons of it in gasoline tins. Instead of paying them off in gold or pearls, they take their pay in flour and a few plugs of tobacco. Yes, the girls all chew tobacco out here, and how they love it. We have chartered a deep-sea-going boat. No luxurious ocean liner, this. Just a purling schooner. But that's about all you'll find in these waters. And after all, what could be more romantic than a purling schooner in Timor Sea? From here, we sail across a lonely sea. No, we have not yet found our Neanderthal man. We have journeyed far among the aborigines of the wasteland, but we found no sign of the man of 50,000 years ago. All we got was a rumor from the broken remnants of the tribe. So we must go further. We must go by sea, far along an unvisited coast where the white man is almost unknown. There, we expect to find far more primitive tribes and types of unknown men. And if we are ever to find Neanderthal man, we'll probably find him somewhere on the edge of Timor Sea. Our voyage is to take us along 900 miles of the most inhospitable coast in the world. And the weather in these waters is of the blow em up calm em down variety. Our little purling schooner is a veteran of the vagaries of the South Sea storms. It doesn't care what happens. She isn't as roomy as an Atlantic liner, and it's hot as the hinges of Hades. If there's a hotter place on Earth than this, you've got to show us. But we have plenty of beer. The folks in Broome insisted that we include several barrels in our cargo. For a while, we take a swim every day because our Abo sailor informs us that sharks never infest these waters. Then one day we inquire why, and he replies, too much crocodile. The currents are so swift and tricky that they make swirling, foaming rapids right in the open sea. One morning we sight this little isle, uncharted on our map. Our abo sailor says that he sees turtle tracks on the distant beach. The heat has spoiled a lot of our food, and we are looking forward to a turtle egg omelet and some terrapin soup. The entire island seems to have turned turtle. We rolled these baby babies over on their backs on our trip ashore last night, and now we're turning them over again so they can ramble into the ocean. 
And they make pretty good time, too, considering the heavy load of armor plate that they carry on their back. They come ashore at night to lay their eggs in the sand. Years ago, a French traveler by the name of Louis de Rougemont came to this strange coast. And when he returned to Paris and London with his tales of these turtles and of how they were so big that he could ride on them, why, the gentlemen of the learned scientific societies laughed at him. They gave him the raspberry. De Rougemont died a pauper, a discredited and a broken man. But de Rougemont was right. Yes, and wouldn't old Louis chuckle with delight if he could see these pictures that prove that he was correct. We find one old boy, one big turtle, that's a foot wider than your family touring car. He tips the beam at 500 pounds. He's about 200 years old, and he doesn't feel a day over 150. But it's the female of the species again that does the heavy work. Look at her go to it with her front flippers. Huh, wonder what she's up to. Maybe it's buried treasure. Maybe the pearl poachers have been hiding their gems here. This coast is notorious for its poachers and for its smugglers. Then we swing around and take a look at the other end of Mrs. Turtle. And lo and behold, she's digging with her hind flippers too. She's not a bit camera shy. She doesn't mind us. She goes right on with her work. And she's ambidextrous, too. First she uses one flipper, then she uses the other, just like a machine, in rhythm. Well, at the end of two hours, the Duchess of Terrapin has excavated a hole. Her hole is two feet deep. And above the opening, she assumes a casual pose. And then, before our startled eyes, she begins laying eggs. Eighty-eight eggs, two at a time. Each egg is about the size of a regulation billiard ball with a soft, rubbery shell. Oh, what an omelet. A turtle egg omelet tastes more like fish than fowl. And one of our avo sailors ate 25 of them raw at one city without batting an eye. What a man. Once Mother Turtle has covered her eggs, they are almost as difficult to find as a Neanderthal man. But old boy Abo, he follows the fin tracks. Then he jabs a stick into the sand, and then he sniffs, and then he digs them up. And the older they are, the better. He prefers his turtle fruit ripe. He prefers it so ripe that we all run the other way. Well, there are countless giant turtles out here, Nearly all of them are big enough for a man to ride on. And it's lucky for the aborigines that the turtles are here. Because in some sections of this coast, there is almost nothing else for the tribesmen to eat. In this one nest, our abo finds exactly 106 eggs. Many a farmer wishes that his hens had a batting average like that. Well, at any rate, we won't starve along this coast. But it may be rather hard on the members of the expedition who don't care for eggs. Nearby in this same sandy incubator, we discover a nest of young turtles who have just emerged from their shells. Dr. Whittington tells us that scientists have never been able to determine how long it takes a turtle brood to hatch. Just another one of the mysteries of nature. Well, we pile a lot of the little fellows on the back of a big chap. Then old man turtle takes his family for a ride but his hard-shelled offspring slide off in all directions into the sand. They spill all over the place, and the old boy pushes right on toward the ocean. He doesn't care a hoot what happens to the family. The youngsters are better looking than the old folks. Yes, this is where your fine tortoiseshell combs come from. Now the villain appears. The arch-villain of the world of turtles. His name is Goanna, but he is also known as the monitor lizard. He has a large blue tongue that darts in and out. He's the scavenger of the Pearl Coast. When we stumbled on this scallywag, he was robbing a turtle's nest. This monitor lizard of the shores of Timor Sea is four feet long. His stomach is still distended with the eggs he has stolen. His bite is not generally fatal, but the wound seldom heals. Back on our pearling schooner, Dr. Withington dissects a turtle. 
he places the turtle's heart on the deck. And there, without the lifeblood coursing through it, the heart continues to beat rhythmically. Having performed continuously for 200 years, it is reluctant to abandon its labors. It continues to beat in this remarkable manner for more than 12 hours. Our stay on that desert island gave us a spicy taste of the joy of wild places. We learned something about giant turtles and about monitor lizards. But what did we learn about Neanderthal man? Not a thing. We have still 400 miles to go. Out on the jib boom, our Abo sailor keeps a weather eye on the submerged reefs and the shoals as the days slide by. Back at Broome, we were told to steer for Sunday Island. And here it is. Why Sunday Island? Well, probably because it was discovered on Tuesday. At any rate, when you're in this part of the world, you don't know whether it's Sunday, Monday, Thursday, or what it is. And you don't care a hoot. You lose all track of time, and after a few weeks, you feel as though you're on another strange planet. Through treacherous waters, through whirlpools, and in and out of reefs, we make for shore like a boatload of Robinson Crusoes. The currents swirl wildly around us, but we're lucky. We manage to dodge through. And here at Sunday Island, we again approach what to us is an unknown region. What will we find here, we wonder. We were told that some particularly wild and primitive people live in this locality. Dropping over a small ridge, we come upon the capital city of Sunday Island. Only it isn't much of a city. The huts are about the size of dog kennels, built of leaves and twigs. But where are the people? Advancing a little farther, we see another group of huts. Yes, there are the tribesmen. They're doing a little broadcasting, a little fire signaling, just as Neanderthal man did thousands of years ago. This is the Sunday Island Radio, and these boys are the local announcers. They're giving a special news broadcast of our arrival. Let's hope their news dispatch doesn't read something like this. Fellow citizens and cannibals, get your pots ready. Here come the missionaries. How did those men of 50,000 years ago kindle a blaze? How did Neanderthal man light his fire? Well, just like this. This boy is watching his father intently. In a few days, he is to pass officially from youth to manhood. Then he must be an expert at many things. And of course, it is fundamental that he should know how to make fire after the manner of his forefathers. And now for one occupation that is unique to Australia, are almost unique. You will find it nowhere else in the world, with the possible exception of some of the more primitive peoples of southern India. Meet the boomerang maker of Sunday Island. Every Australian Aborigine is a boomerang maker and a boomerang thrower. Each man turns out his own curious weapon with the delicate precision of a modern rifle maker. Some of the best boomerangs are made of yari wood. To shape them properly, and at the same time to give them an iron-like temper. The wood is exposed to fire. This process so minimizes brittleness that the weapon can strike a tremendous blow without breaking. Isn't it curious how the Australian Aborigine learned to make this the oddest of all man's weapons? And after he makes it, he tests it against a light breeze. And it is not perfect unless it returns right to the feet of the thrower. These aborigines are more primitive than any we've seen so far. Their weapons are the weapons of the Stone Age. Metals are unknown to them. This, for instance, is the local Krupp foundry. Instead of chromium steel, he uses a kangaroo shin bone and a piece of rock. He makes a spearhead from a fragment of quartz. And this makes us wonder. We wonder whether both he and the American Indian could have been taught this by a common ancestor in some dim, bygone age. Yes, surely we must be on the trail of Neanderthal man at last. At any rate, this is the way the caveman of 50,000 years ago made his spearhead. 
Yes, it's curious how time has stood still out here. Instead of the oxyacetylene torch for welding, this man uses mud and ant gum, a sticky clay, together with a kind of glue that he gets from giant ant hills. And so the spearhead is united to the shaft. And that's just as important to him as forging a 16-inch gun is to the civilized and warlike white man. He uses his primitive spear for war when aborigine meets aborigine, and also for hunting kangaroos and wallabies and the other strange creatures of his tropic realm. But how does he throw it far enough and straight enough to hit anything that isn't deaf, dumb, and blind? When we ask him this, he sends a boy for a notched throwing stick. They call that throwing stick a womera. The womera is to the spear what the gun barrel is to the bullet. And we hope he doesn't forget himself and swing that womera in our direction. It looks like mysterious business to us. We ask him to demonstrate a bit. He says, OK, and starts off with the spear between his toes. And then he heaves it. He heaves it at uh, his pal Rumba Tumba out there, who fortunately knows when to duck. Now he's aiming at a tree. Yes, he's a Womera sharpshooter, all right. We're convinced. Then comes a sound that makes our blood run cold. Three men approach. Each man twirls a curious gadget called a bull roarer. You can hear the unearthly hum for miles. At any rate, it's easy to see how the bull roar gets its name. It's a warning to all women and children, a warning to remain away from the sacred rites. If they peek, their eyes are burned out with flaming brands. The women and children are driven away because they are not allowed to see the forbidden boomerang dance sacred to the dingo. Who's the dingo? Why, the dingo is the ferocious Australian wild dog. Every aborigine has a dingo. The dingo dance sometimes lasts for three weeks. So no wonder they take it easy part of the time and do some of the dingo dance on their knees instead of on their dingoes. I mean their dogs or their feet, I should say. Then from out of the bush appear the gigolos of the tribe. They come to do the Timor Sea Congo. Although the women have fled into the bush, this aborigine shuffle is supposed to have a magical effect on them. The idea is long-distance sex appeal transmitted by shortwave movement. Notice the shortwave movement. The five-piece orchestra is made up of men so old that they can't even keep time with their own music. In our search for Neanderthal man, one of our most important studies is the study of faces. This is the aborigine equivalent of a plug hat. It's made out of boomerang shavings of yari wood. And this old bird is wearing a flock of cockatoo feathers. And his friend Waragamba is adorned with a mother of pearl for a fig leaf. And crow feathers for a top knot. Dr. Withington passes out a few presents for us. We have been well treated by these people. They have been gentlemen toward us, and they expect us to be gentlemen in return. The men come first out here, then women and children last. Well, our camera is so bashful that we have to doll the boys and girls up a bit before they come within range of the lens. When they haven't any callers, they just trot around in their birthday clothes. What's the old boy on the right? The one with the long top knot. His wife is a trifle slow, so he heaves a rock at her. But slow foot and L hasn't any pep. Among the aborigines, the female of the species is called gin. Just gin. The boys out here not only like their gin, but they marry their gin. This is their dance of submission. These are the season's debutantes. The men are not kept away from the women's dance of submission. It's an old Zeke Felder tall custom. It may be their dance of submission, but this is one type of gin that doesn't appeal to the visiting white man. So far as we are concerned, these Arbo beauties are at least 50,000 years behind their European and American sisters. Yes, indeed. But as we watch them, we can't help wondering what they would say. 
if they could see our western shimmy shakes. We also study the faces of the women, hoping to find Miss Neanderthal. But we are not anxious to study them at close range. Uh-uh, nothing done. Whether we find Miss Neanderthal or not, what we do find is a spiffy Mud Marcel. She's a young widow, the merry widow of the tribe. She cannot remarry until her hair grows to normal length and the mud falls off. These women are all under 30, and most of them are still in their early 20s. Yes, they seem to lose their fatal beauty rather early out here. This is the dance that brings howls of delight to the tired black businessman of Sunday Island. And I wonder what kind of howls it would bring from the boys in the bald-headed row if this chorus were put on the stage in London or New York. I am afraid they'd get the raspberry. But our aboriginal debutantes have never even heard of New York or London. These boys might not be able to navigate a fleet of dreadnoughts through the Panama Canal. But just give them a few sticks for a raft, and they'll make the first Lord of the Admiralty look like a landlubber. Water seems to be their native element. They shoot these boiling rapids as casually as we would take a ride in a taxi cab down Pennsylvania Avenue or along Piccadilly. Then when they reach a quieter stretch, they pull in for shore. They haven't any alpenstocks or spike boots. Just watch them gallop up the cliff. They climb like monkeys. Probably just as our Neanderthal man did 50,000 years ago. The way they scramble over the rocks makes us feel that we may be on the, li uh, on the right track after all. At night, we are awakened by a weird chant. And the rattle of boomerangs. We learn that a boy is to be initiated into manhood in accordance with ancient tribal rites. Tomorrow, his initiation will bestow upon him the rank of a warrior, and the lad must face the harsh ordeal without a tremor. The final test will come at sunrise after this dance. Meanwhile, all through the night, dancing warriors wave magic branches and boomerangs. They do this in order to drive off the evil spirits. They believe that if even one evil spirit remains, it will weaken the lad so that he will be unable to endure the initiation. Symbolic gates signifying the coming of friendly spirits are waved back and forth by the painted warriors. The friendly spirits are the ancestors of the boy who is to become a man at dawn. There is no ceremony here in wild Australia more important than this of ushering a boy into the estate of manhood. After tomorrow, he will be a full-fledged boomerang thrower and kangaroo hunter, or he'll be an outcast. The time of the ordeal approaches. If the boy wavers or winces, his chance of achieving manhood vanishes, and he becomes an outcast for life. The lad takes his seat before the chieftain, who is about to lacerate his gums with a pearl-shell knife. The father holds his hand. And then the chief knocks out two middle upper teeth. The lad dare not groan or display any sign of pain, but he never falters. And thus, by this baptism of blood, the boy is elevated to the status of a man in wild Australia. This is his mark of maturity. Though barely 10 years of age, he may now seek a wife. Someday, no doubt, he will be fully as proud of his tribal markings as his father is proud of his. And if he becomes a chieftain, he will wear the pearl shell knife like this to be used to pierce the gums of other lads. Goodbye, Sunday Island, and a fond farewell to you, you fine old boomerang thrower. Here's a hat, a clay pipe, and a plug of tobacco. What man could ask for more? If you don't like the brand, you can trade the plug of tobacco for another wife. What a life. The clues he and his people gave us send us farther, ever farther along this torrid coast. For almost a month, we weave in and out of shoals and islets, and we're getting short of kangaroo meat. So our native sailors decide to catch a dugong. A dugong is an aquatic mammal, variously termed a sea cow or a sea hog. 
In fact, the dugong is a sort of submarine farm, I guess. It is found nowhere else in the world except along this northerly coast of Australia and off the shores of wild New Guinea and the other savage islands in these parts. In a short time, our four abos sight a dugong. He's loafing along below the surface of the water. They maneuver to get a shot with our steel harpoon. The lad in the bow tries a new one. He throws himself overboard, drives the harpoon deep into the dugong. The harpooner clambers back into the canoe. The line pays out with a rush, and the dugong vanishes into the depths. But the dugong tires quickly, and in a little while, we have the old fellow alongside. Mr. Dugong, when we get a look at him, uh, turns out to have a bright yellow hide. His body looks something like a porpoise. Yes, and look what that doggone dugong did to our best three-quarter inch steel harpoon. Why, he almost made a fish hook out of it. Think of the strength required to twist steel like this. The outer skin of this strange creature of Timor Sea is about an eighth of an inch thick. Dr. Withington explores Mr. Dugong. Underneath, he finds an inch and a half of fat that looks like pork. Then the doctor tries to cut it with his knife. We all crowd around to watch him because this is the first dugong we've ever seen. In fact, some of us had never even heard of such a curious creature of the deep until we came out here. When cooked, dugong meat tastes like overripe fish. And I'm afraid it smells like a platter of last year's clams. So we don't find it any too appetizing. But the abos love it. This is an ear. And this tiny aperture is an eye. And up on top of the skull, skull, we discover a curious valve-like opening. This is the nostril. Well, the looks of the dugong justify his name, the sea hog. And then, too, the dugong grazes on deep sea grass, and for that reason, he is often called the sea cow. But his snout is unlike anything else on earth, or in the sea, for that matter. And this, too, makes us feel as though we're on another planet. For ten weeks, we have been sailing the torrid Timor Sea. We have beaten our way across many leagues of unfrequented waters that lie to the north of Australia. And now, at last, we are approaching our goal, or we hope we are. On the 73rd day after our departure from Broome, we see clouds of smoke on the continental coast. Signals, perhaps. Visitors seldom come here. And they probably have sighted our boat from afar off. We make out three figures on the rocky shore, and we wonder if they'll be hostile. They are watching us intently, but they display not the slightest sign of fear, nor do they seem to have the least desire to run away. Surely they must be primeval men who have not yet learned to fear other men. We have at last reached the part of Australia's remote northwest where we think we have a chance. At any rate, we approach this coast with the hope that somewhere here we will find the living remnant of that race of 50,000 years ago. Three of the strangers into our little boat. We invite them to come out to the schooner and look us over. And they come as nonchalantly as though it were an everyday occurrence instead of their first experience. Make yourselves at home, boys. This little party has been arranged especially in your honor. A thousand years ago, they ran out of fly swatters along Timor Sea. The flies of northern Australia are the most pestiferous horde of insects this side of purgatory. Though their bites are poisonous to the white man, the blacks of Timor Sea are immune. Our object is to make friends with these strange fellows so that they will be our allies and supporters through the adventure that is at hand. We can tell by their faces that they would not be pleasant enemies. They haven't lost their cannibal instincts yet. We go ashore knowing that the season of the monsoons is at hand. And unless we get away from here in a week or two, we may be trapped on this desolate coast. Other members of the flyback tribe receive us, but they receive us with such ominous tranquility 
that we are afraid they are liable to present us with a boomerang to the city. But our three friends who came out to the schooner do noble service. They call out to the others that we are just a party of visiting firemen out for a holiday and not to be alarmed. These men are the finest physical specimens we have seen so far. They are true sons of the earth. They sleep where night overtakes them. Nude, free, and untrammeled, they have roamed this bleak, barren territory like so many apes for untold centuries. For them, time has indeed stood still. They neither build bridges nor play bridge. They fly no airplanes. Why, they never even flew a kite. Yes, here is human life in its lowest form. We have turned back the pages of history. We are looking at our own ancestors of 50,000 years ago. We are shaking hands with the boys at the bottom of our own family tree. At any rate, so it seems. Because we intend to pass a week or more with this tribe, we take care to win the goodwill of the women. They are extremely suspicious and superstitious. And if they suddenly got the notion that we are in league with the evil spirits, our whole expedition might come to a sad, sad end. The debutante or dowager of Park Avenue has her pet Pekingese. The debutante or dowager of Timor Sea has her pet Dingo, the wild dog of Australia. Now, these ladies would hardly take any prizes at the Atlantic City Beauty Show. But at that, they're a lot better looking than the men. The women in every clime like presence. Broadway has its gimme girls, and so has Timor C. So we give them pandanus nuts, a rare, bitter-tasting delicacy. And do the girls like the nuts? I'll say they do. They are so busy devouring them that they don't even know that a camera is pointed their way. Whether these girls are related to Neanderthal man or not, their nutcrackers certainly belong to the Stone Age. If there is one thing they like better than fricasseed kangaroo, it's pandanus nuts. The scars on the shoulders of some of the women, or some of the gins, I should say, denote widowhood. The closely cropped hair of a few signifies that already they have snared a second husband. And according to custom, the second husband will wear the missing tresses as a belt. We see two girls wearing their own hair around the waist in this fashion. They are ready to turn the hair belts over to their next husbands if they're lucky enough to get them. In a moment of rash generosity, we supply the girls with our only cake of soap, and they seem to need it. But instead of using it to wash, they eat it. Venus at the bath in Australia. As night approaches, the usual preparations for a fire are begun. Though our thermometer registers 116 degrees in mid-afternoon, within a few hours it will have dropped to 50 or even lower. Cold night is fashionable out here, for it is then that the natives literally put on the dog. Exceptionally cold nights are known as three dog nights when the aborigines use three bed warmers. One dog at the feet, another around the neck, and a third at the small of the back. A one dog night, therefore, is comparatively mild. Imagine the conversation the next morning when Marumbaji says in passing, Why, George, it was cold in Aragunya last night. I had to use three dogs. And Waragumba replies, You're a cuckoo. I used only two, and before morning threw one of them over to the wife. Some of the boys are going through their setting up exercises. While their wives are fixing some kangaroo hash and scrambling a few turtle's eggs for breakfast, the men are limbering up their spears and warambas. And now it's our business to make a methodical study of these people. Man after man, we must observe the members of this tribe until we find a trace of the Neanderthal. That is, if it is here. For these are perhaps the most primitive of all the primitive peoples of the Australian bush. What a strange old world this is. What strange people some of our fellow mortals are. Why, these old boys have never heard of England. They've never heard of America. They've never he or even heard of the great city of Milwaukee. This warrior belongs to another tribe. He has been sheltered here ever since his relatives mysteriously disappeared when he was on a hunting trip. The body lacerations, which are his most precious adornment, were inflicted with spearheads when he was a mere boy. The wounds were filled with clay so that when the flesh healed, the scars came to resemble great wealth. 
There is an amazing variety in these faces. They are all the same color, a deep brown, but they don't belong to the black race. And aside from color, each man seems to be unrelated to his brother tribesmen. One may, re may resemble a Malay, another may resemble a Hindu, and still another may look like a Jew. Where under the sun did these people come from originally? This is one thing that the scientists don't know. Here we find a medley, a mixture, an amalgam of many types of humanity. Here indeed is a backwash where many different broken remnants of contrasting peoples and tribes have drifted. They have come here in unknown ways and in unknown times through the blank spaces of an unknown past. Look how weirdly different these faces are. Remember that face we saw at the American Museum in New York? This reconstruction of the Neanderthal man, the man of long ago who hunted and fished in the primeval forests of Europe thousands of years before the dawn of civilization, before the dawn of history? Well, note the resemblance between the famous museum bus and our modern specimen of the cave dweller. Yes, here surely is our Neanderthal man, and what a face. Yes, here he is. Here is what we have come 10,000 miles to find. Let's look at him closely for a moment. Look at that massive skull, those beetling brows, the expression of heavy ferocity, that ponderous ape-like jaw. And when we found this man, we felt that our expedition had not been in vain. Yet here is a living specimen of the cave man. Well, the amazing thing about this quest of ours is that we not only found what we came for, but we also found something even more startling, and we didn't have to wait many minutes now. And just before the surprise comes, we stand watching little Bimbo, the boy Bush, and he does the Timor Sea cakewalk. He's the son of a chief, and he goes through this dance with all the confidence and assurance of a veteran. The tribesmen are dancing a dance of friendship and farewell. Queer steps, weird music, unutterably primitive, repulsively barbaric, dark savagery. The tribesmen have decorated their bodies with a mixture of white clay. Their dance doesn't seem to be a joyous affair. They're in deadly earth. They're a serious people. They even take their festival seriously and solemnly. The lad has already chosen his bride, or rather, she has been picked for him. Romantic love as we know it is unknown to these people. The little girl now coming in uh, on the left with the close cropped hair and wearing the white loincloth is to be his wife. So they dance together in celebration. Of course, of course, they're both too young to know what it's all about. To them, well, it's just another dance. The lad dances like a veteran. He seems as nonchalant as the older man. Probably he's been practicing these steps ever since he learned to walk. Then he changes to a new movement, a more complicated one that resembles shadow boxing put to music. They do it all with a solemnity that makes us feel as though we are witnessing a secret religious ceremony. Great Jupiter, and what's this? See that fair-haired boy there on the right? A blonde child among these aborigines. Great Scott, how can this be? Can he be an albino, a freak, or is he really a white child? Have we stumbled on something here? Well, dimly we remember having heard back at Sydney and at the pearl fishers at Broome. Tales of white people lost among the abysmal savages of the Australian wilds of the Never Never Land. Blank mystery comes over us. Yes, and that question mark in our minds now becomes two question marks. Look, look at the man at the end of the line. Look what he's wearing, a woman's underclothing. Step in, step in as sure as you're born. First a blonde child, then a woman's undergarment. What's the explanation? Here he is again. There in the middle of the line, great Caesar's ghost. We ask who he is, and we're told that he's the blonde boy's father. What? This aborigine, the father of that white boy? Well, there must be some fantastic explanation. Yes, we must get to the bottom of it. What crazy business can it be anyhow? It seems incredible. What a curious, foolish sort of dance. Primitive, well, childish, but apparently not to them. They're in dead earnest. They seem to be imitating kangaroos but they tell us that it's called the crow dance. 
Evidently, it's a serious matter to them. Here in the land of the boomerang and the Neanderthal man, the big event of the year is the tribal corroboree. Jamboree, we call it. And it ends with the symbolic dance, the dance of the crow. But our eyes are irresistibly drawn back to that point, that fair-haired land. What is the story behind all this? To say that we are puzzled would be putting it mildly. And we make up our minds not to sail back across Timor Sea until we get to the bottom of it. Well, they tell us this ceremony occurs only once a year. We try in vain to figure out the strange ritual. And at the end of the dance, the performers give their version of how the crows bear away their prey, and they carry off the man and the woman step in. And when they finally drop the father of the blonde boy, and when the crowd scatters and he starts away, after the aborigine corroboree is over, we decide to follow. We are told that he lives apart from the rest of the tribe for some reason, and that adds to our curiosity. We learn also that he only wears the flimsy garment on this one ceremonial occasion. Well, it's got us guessing. And if at all possible, we're going to find out how this grotesque thing came about and what it means. He makes a curious, fantastic, almost comic picture, this Australian bushman in the white woman's underclothing. He knows we're following him. Well, at least we think he does. He can hardly help seeing us, although we do stay a short distance off, and although we're using our telephoto lens. Even though we're pointing our camera his way, it doesn't seem to bother him much, except that he acts rather puzzled. <laughs> he isn't half as puzzled as we are. The presents we have given to him and to his people probably make him feel that we mean no harm. And then we hardly look very dangerous. We purposely left all our weapons back on the lugger in order to win their confidence. And he and his brother tribesmen outnumber us 50 to 1. We couldn't do much with rocks and clubs against those odds, even if we had to fight them. Nevertheless, he stalks warily along boomerang in hand, ready for an emergency. And we hope he doesn't buzz the old boomerang our way. On and on he goes, over the steep trail. Where is he leading us? A few more miles of boulders, and we come upon his home. It's a cave. Seated before it is a woman. A woman with a shock of gray hair. There doesn't seem to be anything of an aborigine about her. Maybe here's our answer. Yes, here must be the solution to our mystery. She's a white woman. Why, she's just as white as you or I. What under the sun can her story be? Well, hoping that her caveman won't resent our intrusion and hoping that he'll not use his boomerang on us, we step forward. Hello, hello. We call out to him in tones just as friendly as we can make them. And as we do so, the woman slips into the cave. Our bushman stands there puzzled. He's still wondering, no doubt, just why we are so interested and why we have trailed him. He utters something in his harsh, guttural tongue, something that seems to mean, well, all right, come on, come on, what's up? A plug of tobacco, which he immediately eats, puts him in an easier frame of mind. He still looks at us, wondering, but he doesn't seem at all warlike. So we squeeze his arm, the traditional friendly gesture of the bush. And then we ask about his costume, that curious, flimsy garment, and he indicates that they belong to her. We inquire about her. He steps to the entrance and calls her. He speaks softly, reassuringly. And a moment later, to greet us, emerges the white woman. And Our Lady of Mystery has blue eyes and fair skin. She seems to be somewhere between 30 and 35. There's nothing Neanderthal about her. Why, she might walk the streets of Liverpool or Topeka, but not in this costume. At any rate, she surely is a white woman. Gray, Scott, how did she get here? Impassively, without a word, she goes about her housewifely duties, roasting a baby kangaroo for her man. Then, the animal cook, she passes it to him. And he, in turn, politely offers us a portion. Her lips are moving. We hear mumbled sounds. Familiar syllables. English. White man, she says. I, I'm a white woman. The sounds are clumsy, halting, as though she had not spoken a word of English in a long time. Yes, our suspicions are confirmed. She is a white woman. But how did she get stranded on this godforsaken coast? How under the sun did this white woman come here? How did this daughter of the lordly Caucasian come to be the wife of cave-dwelling man? 
Whatever brought you here, we asked you. How do you happen to be living with this tribe? And so it was that the story of this aboriginal wife was told to us as we sat there that afternoon in tropical Australia, a thousand miles from nowhere. She was the widow, she said, of a pearling captain of Thursday Island. She was a bit vague about it. Long years here among the wild people had left her somewhat uncertain. But we gathered that her husband's pearling schooner had been dashed on the reef years before. She alone survived. When the pearling schooner was pounded to pieces, the waves threw her on the beach and she was rescued by the aborigines. Apparently, they believed her a ghost. That was because she was so white. Several warriors claimed her as the spirit of their dead wives and there were bitter boomerang jewels. One man, man was a better boomerang thrower than the others. And he won the ghost prize. He of the step in, the man we had followed to this cave. And this cleft in the rock had become her home just as Neanderthal man of 50,000 years ago did with his woman. Here she had learned the household duties of a cave wife, how to roast kangaroo, how to keep comfortable on those three dog nights, and how to polish the hunter's boomerang. She didn't seem at all excited over seeing us, and as for a motion picture camera, well, she had never even heard of such a thing. In fact, she seems almost as primitive and simple-minded as the aborigine, a female Robinson Crusoe. She came from Thursday Island, and she lives here in a cave with her man, Frank. Yes, the little blonde boy was her. He was born, she reared him as devotedly as if his father had been a British Jew. She had almost forgotten Thursday Island and the white man's land beyond. It seemed like a dream. We thought it might be a noble thing to bring her back. You want to come with us, we asked. We'd gladly bring you. But the aboriginal wife shook her head. These were the black depths of savagery to us on this coast, but not to her. Here she had her man and her boy. She was content. Here in a rude, primitive life, against the bosom of the earth, she had found a measure of happiness. That other world, the distant world toward which we were heading, that strange world, she almost forgot. She shook her head and repeated, no, no. So we returned to our schooner, ready to outrace the approaching monsoon. As we sailed back across Timor Sea, she waved to us from a lofty rock. Fate had abandoned her at one of the most remote spots in all the world. A storm had thrown her among the people of the cave, but she had made the most of it. She had her man, she had her child. The wind bellowed out our sails, and homeward bound our thoughts were not so much concerned with Neanderthal man as they were with that lonely woman, that aboriginal wife of Timor Sea, the shipwrecked wife of the white pearling captain who had been left by fate among the people of the Stone Age and who had pluckily decided to resign herself to this life to the end.